Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight and thank you for all of you for, for being here and traveling so far to join us. Um, we, have, we can keep this fairly informal since it seems like we have a pretty intimate crowd today. And um, so I, I thought we could start off by just kind of going down the line and um, for each of you to, to share a little about the project, to contextualize it for folks who maybe weren't here for the, um, the opening yesterday or haven't had a chance to maybe read through the descriptions yet and to, to describe what you worked on and, and sort of the shape of the project. And especially since I know a lot of these projects are connected to much longer practices and, and ongoing investigations. So um, if that's the case, if you can talk about those as well. Me? Oh. <laughs> Too much. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> so my my pieces are the the paper sculptures over there that are on the side for the moment, and they were um, part of a series of sculptures that I created while I was in residence at Recology San Francisco, which is um, the San Francisco dump essentially, and um, they have an artist in residence program there where they invite artists to come and spend four months there and we have access to the dispos public disposal area and they just ask that basically almost everything that we create is at least 90, 95% from materials that we gather from the disposal pile. Um, and I wanted to use that my time there as a, as a way of looking at what was happening in the city and particularly in, uh, in the changes happening in the city with people being displaced and pushed out um, because of the affordability crisis in, in our city. Um, you know, what's getting left behind? What, what is the evidence in what um, people lose in that transition? And I went in expecting to find, you know, kind of obvious signs of that, like real estate signs or moving boxes or things like that. Um, and I did find some of those things, but a lot of what I also found were both evidence of people's personal lives and so the stories that um, were suggested by you know, things that used to be a part of their homes and creating the spaces that they lived in, um, as well as um, things that suggested the policies behind that. So some of the most exciting things I found were like policy documents from you know, the 1960s that were part of the redevelopment era and maps of the city. And so it, it was both this very intimate um, investigation into like this very vulnerable part of people's belonging, um, but also the, that sort of macro level of like what's happening in the city, what's, what are the decisions that are impacting these things. And so these two pieces in particular were ones that were maybe more on that um, macro level of looking at what was happening in the city. Um, and so I wanted to show, especially the, the floor piece here in, um, in Chinatown because it was actually inspired by some of the conversations I was having with folks here in Chinatown and at CCC around public space. So the, this space 41 Ross is part of an alleyway, um, alleyway planning and the, um, an attempt by CCC and for Chinatown Community Development Center to look at public space in the neighborhood. And because Chinatown has so little public open green space, um, the alleyways are, are part of the, a really important part of the cultural fabric here. And so um, that's why they started the space. And that was a lot of the inspiration behind that. So the little trees on one end of it are um, pieces that I cut out of a map of the city that I found and um, as a way of looking at what, what green spaces do exist here and I clustered them by neighborhood so each of those trees represents a neighborhood in the city so one of the ones that only has tiny little bits is Chinatown um, and I also wanted to so on the other end of it is this little model of an alleyway which was actually inspired by some of the work happening here and so looking at both public space um, run as shaped by the government by community organizations and then the green model at the, on the floor there is um, some of the privately owned public spaces that get attached to new developments in the city. So trying to look at how those things are shaped um, and how you know, even access to conversations around the environment and gathering space and, and greenery is, um, is shaped by these, these policies. So I'll stop talking now. Hi, I, I am Ilana, part of TRES, uh, Interdisciplinary Mexican Art Collective. And we, we have uh, been investigating 
garbage for the past 10 years, our, our piece, well, this is part of our piece back here, and it's not really the complete image because most of what we do is uh, art-based research, so it implies a lot more work than what is actually seen in a gallery space. But what we do is scavenge for pieces of trash and try to trace the stories that they tell. Uh, we, we won the WMA Commission for Waste, and that opportunity to work in Hong Kong uh, opened a global oceanscape for garbage and the way it circulates across the oceans. So a lot of the objects you see back here we collected on the beaches of Hong Kong and uh, the, the complete story behind these pieces are in the book Obikutu's Trash that's on the table behind it you can see. Mm. I'll let Rodrigo when it's his turn oh continue with the next part. <laughs> <laughs> But meanwhile, Gaoling is on my right-hand side, and I will introduce her. <laughs> oh, please, In interrupt us. My turn? Yes. Oh, you guys. <laughs> okay. My project is about uh, air pollution. Since 2013, I uh, studied this project from uh, in when I was in London. Um, that time I saw China was like uh, um, in a very beautiful view <laughs> that is like uh, in the uh, ink painting, Chinese traditional ink painting. But then um, actually it's pollution. You, you, yeah, then I feel like I should do something. Um, before I go back to Beijing, <laughs> then I organized the open call, um, invite friends and artists and some yeah, other um, yeah, people join this project. Then I uh, received um, many from Gmail and from the, uh, Facebook and uh, also Chinese um, social media, such as uh, Weibo and uh, Douban. Yeah. And uh, I can maybe let me tell you some <laughs> story about the project. Um, yeah, maybe um, from maybe there, maybe afterwards I can show you there's uh, one like uh, Chai, um, one person artist from uh, American, but she's Chinese. Her uh, parents are uh, Cantonese, and she was um, there's in the picture. She was like uh, jumping into the um, swimming pool, and which is <laughs> really her mother catch the moment when the, she was jumping exactly to the uh, swimming pool. And the other day, um, her mom was jumped into the <laughs> swimming pool too, <laughs> which is very interesting. They were like uh, um, doing a, how to say, uh, I don't know how to say in English, but they were doing a uh, 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 Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, some other story like uh, this uh, in one of these GIF um, animation, there is one girl. Um, yeah, she was like uh, wearing holiday, <laughs> yeah, clothes and was like having a holiday. Um, and then, but she felt like, oh, the air pollution is coming, so <laughs> it's like totally dying. Uh, it's a very short um, GIF animation. So I can uh, send them from the Weibo, from the social media, so immediately. So that's also um, become some uh, more, uh, how to say, material or uh, me uh, mixed media thing. Mm, so, yeah, and the, some people asked me about yesterday, uh, the performance um, from the rolling um, fabric. Um, there are some letters from the beginning where, uh, when I was organizing the uh, project, um, some yeah, the people sending me uh, pictures about the air pollution, about the feeling, and the describe uh, how strong it is. And some are um, tell me uh, the 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 picture about the air pollution, which is the, the zoom out, and then you can see. And uh, yesterday, um, some people must see from the performance, we were reading very carefully <laughs> in the dark and cannot really see we wearing the mask. And 
I, I want to make the performance to, to let people maybe feeling about um, how pollution um, um, how does it affect our, our life. So um, actually when I was in the pollution um, in, in, in day in Beijing, I feel like uh, my, uh, my eye, my ear and nose and uh, every uh, part of your more the, the feeling more lighter and you like uh, under the water or uh, yeah something like that so maybe yesterday the strange group <laughs> a little bit like uh, like that yeah mm. the project is still ongoing so <laughs> welcome to <laughs> you guys to <laughs> send your pictures your gif animation or any ideas yeah thank you uh, welcome. <laughs> uh, I'm Rodrigo and I'm a co-founder of uh, Teres. And, and for this project, I think that is the beginning of the biggest uh, research. Uh, this project uh, gives us the possibility of uh, going uh, deeper in the research about the trash and the movement of the trash in Hong Kong specifically in the Southeast uh, China Sea. So I want to tell one story that is in the book in, uh, to try to explain more what Elena was just saying uh, a couple of minutes ago. And during our trip, we, we really love to just be around and try to follow in the different routes that the trash had in the city. So we went to different uh, transfer stations and we talk with politicians and with uh, academics in the Hong Kong University and uh, with activists uh, to try to understand like all the context that the trash had you know, that every time that we found uh, an object in the streets so during this trip we went to Lantau Island and we found in Tom Fook Beach and a small bottle cap with the face of a, of a guy uh, that we assume that were very famous uh, in, in star in the in, in Asia. We didn't know anything about him because for us was completely an unknown person. But but we thought that oh my God, who puts his face into the bottle cup and just sp spread away uh, all around the world? So we just start collecting. Uh, I don't know. There, there were maybe hundreds of him just throwing away in the beach. So uh, at the end, we just started the, the making the research and we just found that this guy, Nicolas Che, was a very famous guy. In, in, it was a pop star in Hong Kong and he was just making movies uh, all around and he was just married with a very famous, uh, I think that the Chinese uh, actress. And we just discovered that this guy was just making like a, some kind of a Red Bull drink and he was just using uh, his image to promote the drink. I, I think that for said it more. So we just make a research trip to Hong Kong for a month and then we just came back to Mexico City and we just start to ask him to a lot of people uh, to try to find the other parts of the missing bottle of the trash that we found, because every time that we found uh, a trash, there are some parts that are just in, in another in, a, in, in another parts in, in the world, you know, like spread away. So we just start to, the, to try to reveal or uh, to start a reconstruction uh, about the object, and also we love to see in the different marks that the, that the city produce in the trash and give them their own personality. So that led us, uh, that research told us that um, that energy drink, it wasn't sell it in Hong Kong, it was just sell it in mainland China. So that told us that that bottle cup was just travel in a certain way to that beach. And, and for us, it was more than clear that it was just coming from one of the rivers that was just coming out from China and going 
into the sea and then finally uh, disposed at, at one of the beaches that was there. So we just started to trace all, uh, not all the different materials that the, this little drink uh, has it. So I think that the lender sent like a, Asked for a favor, no? And a student that was just traveling to China or something. So we were just like very desperate trying to find that bottle. And at the end, we just find it and we just discovered that that bottle uh, has it more than four different kinds of uh, plastics and we just start to trace everything. And at the end, I think that we found all the distribution that has it in Alibaba and all these things. and all the love story with this guy and the actress and, <laughs> and that just amazed us. Uh, it was just super amazing. So this project was at, uh, at the end about all the objects that we found that was just telling us a lot of the different stories that are just behind of the trash that, that told us uh, who we are as a society and as humans and with our behaviors and with our, uh, I don't know, different uh, contexts in different parts of the world. So uh, I think that basically with that example, uh, I can explain part of what we do and uh, what the WMA Commission uh, gives us the opportunity to, to make. So uh, thank you for coming. and. Sorry for my terrible English, but I'm a little tired. <laughs> Thanks. Well, my, my English is not good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I need, I need to step and help me to translation. Okay. And we can look at we are the theme of this project. And we are talking about the so the work is by Dance Ecology and is a dance film about the relationship between plastic bottles or plastic products in general and people. Actually,我们在讲这个塑胶议题的时候，其实大家都会认为塑胶跟对人其实是不好的，但是其实就我们在研究这议题的时候发现，其实塑胶跟人其实我们刚刚找到一个平衡点，才会是对这个世界会是比
And so uh, it was a very striking experience for me. And so, so to give you some background of the island, so you know, um, so when we think about Taiwan now, it's primarily um, a Chinese place. But before the Chinese came, it's actually inhabited by a lot of indigenous tribes. And on Lanyu, the tribe is called the Tao tribe. So they are actually genetically closer to the Filipinos, to the Chinese. So you can imagine that the way that they are, lo they are living is really different from the mainland. And because it's outlying, so um, it's synthesized at a very late stage after the 20th century. So till the early 20th century, they're living without money, without capitalism. So can you imagine? So people just fished and they farm. But of course, with the influx of capitalism and modern de development, a lot of things have changed. So the bottles that you are seeing here um, is actually my travel log when I first visited the island. So all these striking moments. Say so at the far end, you see a lot of goats climbing on the cliffs. Goats are supposed to be secret to the island. And when I first arrived, my host told me that when you drive, you have to be very careful and do not hit the goats. And I was expecting him to say that because they're secrets, so the people will be so upset. But no, what he said was that each of them cost 8,000 Taiwanese dollar. Mm -hmm. And I was super sad because it's like they are like, um, understanding the value of something that's so important to them with a dollar sign. So and, and maybe I'll just talk about another story. So here somewhere around you'll see a young man in the middle of the beach. So um, he's, the man, he's a young man that showed me around the island one day. And he shared with me um, the memories of his grandmother. So in, I think, maybe in the 50s or, or around that time. So um, Taiwanese tourists started to visit Lanyu. And the type of tourism was that they would arrive in the morning and then they would walk around the beautiful island and when they see the local indigenous children in the traditional dress, they will throw candies at them. And it's very humiliating. And the saddest thing is that the young man told me that after graduation, he wanted to open an inn. So they knew that tourism is kind of like harming the island in a way. But then it's also bringing in the cash they need. So I was in the middle of all this, in front of a really beautiful island that is facing all these challenges, and challenging its cultural as well as ecological sustainability. And in the middle of all this, I uh, ran into something really visible. So you know, so now the, the main source of income for the island is tourism. And every inn gives each tourist four bottles of water a day. So you can imagine, after all these days, where do all these bottles go? They have nowhere to go. And people are apparently not bringing it back to the mainland. So they're all piling up. And the island is covered by, I was saying tens of thousands, and I thought about it, maybe it's not, maybe like hundreds of thousands. So it's all covered by bottles. And nobody is doing anything about it except a local uh, indigenous, indigenous man, whose name is Awen. And he and his volunteers took the initiative to start clearing up the beaches and they tried to do recycling and eventually they started an education hub. So I was very touched. And so, yeah, and, and then eventually we talk about the idea of telling the story through our little children book. So we work on this together and now this book is um, shared with people everywhere and it's also sold on the island to raise funds for him. Hi, and I just saw your book and I saw uh, several leave uh, 11 and I've been to Orchid Island before 7-Eleven is there. And there's a two bay one in one, uh, in, yeah, yeah, one tribe and I just swim in the bay and and around the stone to other bay, but it's really clear here and it's other bay, other bay, it's really uh, garbage in the sea. So I have to dive inside to, to on the land beside, uh, under the garbage. But I think those garbage may be around the world and collect in those islands. Yeah. Yeah, it's in, in the Orchid Island before 7-Eleven, it's many garbage there. And uh, in my book, my work's there, and my project is about 
1960 to 1918, Taiwan have many factory from all of the world, but there is still pollution on peoples and the land. And I dig the mud and make the pottery, make the bowl. And after that, I want to show people not just on the stage. So I drive the car and make some food to put on the bowl and give people, ask them, it, do, do you want uh, to eat it? Want to there to eat it or not and only yesterday only Stephanie don't want to eat but everyone <laughs> everyone eat the eat the food it's yeah everyone know but everyone uh, ignore it's really like uh, in the land everyone face to the garbage and this story is about a, like a legacy in Kaohsiung, Taiwan Kaohsiung, and I asked my father to play the character, and it's me image for the future. It's the land in Kaohsiung called Dalingpu, and people put the garbage inside the sea to make a plate flat. Tianping. Uh, yeah, landfill. And there's a magnet factory around the village. And people influenced by the government, by the company, and change their lifestyle, like dig the mud, uh, no, dig the heavy metal to, to, to make money. So from the mud, uh, because I'm in the university, I manager uh, make the pottery, but every, Clay, I, I use money to buy, but clay it's really natural thing. Why we have to pay money to 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 make the pottery? So I try to dig the mud from every place. So I connect people and people, human and with the land, their relationship. And this factory is really far from our daily life, but it's really. Uh, happened in this world and before and what I enjoy and what women sound so we uh, yeah yeah our life it's depend on those factory and those pollution so I connect those together. Yes. <laughs> Thank you everyone. So one of the things that strikes me in, in hearing about all of the projects and it's also um, thinking about the context that you know this is in conjunction with the climate summit and so there's all of these uh, policy discussions and even in the connections that you have with um, the Wing Foundation, with uh, Bamboo Curtain, that there's these, um, these dialogues with um, not only the arts community but how this connects to the to politicians, activists, other people doing work around these issues. And so I'm curious if you, can you talk a little bit about what some of those conversations are, the ways that you've been able to influence other people or what you would like um, you know, people who might be here for the summit to take away from your projects and uh, how to, to shape policies or laws or, or social movements around these issues. Well, for us, I don't think we can really think about shaping policies at this level, but it's more about establishing connections and an intimate relationship with materiality that we don't have. So when we recover these objects and we share them with everybody, it's because we really think there's an intimate connection between us and the objects we produce, we use, and we discard, and that if we had a more intense relationship with these objects, perhaps we could see waste from a different perspective and not just as useless and valueless, more as valuable information and a source of endless, not only stories, but also, yeah, stories and information, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just, I just want to 
say something more. And, 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 and I think that is, that I think that we just talked about maybe a couple of days ago. And how was it the relation that we established with the objects? I don't know, my, my grandparents used to have a, and, and I always make this relation, you know? when, when my grandparents buy a, a, a photographic camera, he, he, he knew that it was just forever and he wanted to just pass the camera through the family because the objects were, dis were designed and made in a different form. So, in some point we just lost like this connection with what we produce and we are just like producing massive things like without no sense and and, and for us it's like discovering um, like the, the own personality of the objects and the differences that every ob object had uh, as a metaphor of uh, uh, giving an importance and make them emerge from, well, I don't know. Anyone? Uh, in the place, I take the mud, one of the place called RCA, and it's in the north side of Taiwan. It's a, a TV company from USA, and they still fight for their right. Like 30 years ago, 1960 till now, they still fight for their right. And this issue, I, I know this issue when I was third grade. And now all of my, my classmates don't know that issue. And I think uh, our gener gen generation become more to know about uh, this issue or even uh, social, this social issue. And when our age can vote, it's really influence the policy now. It's what we can do. Um, that is a very interesting question. So when I was um, working with Awen on the project, I met with a lady in Taiwan. And so I told her um, in great excitement how I was touched by his work. And then the lady very calmly said that, mm, but that is not the way. So if you want to push for change, you go to the corporations, you go to the government, you leverage the media, you go for big change. Well, I think change comes at many level. So uh, um, like over the course of history, we'll see how culture managed to shape people's mentality and then that, that lead to change maybe at the policy level. But then I think it's a very long process. And so while I believe in the, the eventual impact on this kind of work, I think it's important that we do not inflate or overstate the advocacy of the practice. But then, so, so sometimes it really takes a long time or maybe nothing will come through. But I believe in how we can provide a perspective that would change action at the personal level. And I think that is important because like big things are created by all these tiny little actions and decisions. So when they oh so we're seeing all these bottles over there now now. So when most people see the bottles, the first question that they will ask is that are the bottles clean? They worry about the performance, the, 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 the dirty or the smell is not good, yeah. So it's interesting, but we don't people normal people don't care about this. Yeah. For my project, I I got like one year ago, um, one Chinese 
in person. Like uh, he's asking me, uh, do you afraid about uh, your project? Because it's about the air pollution. It's about, uh, it's it's uh, yeah connected to the industry world and also the uh, the, the social thing. So I I think um, in China it's very. <laughs> Yeah, can be <laughs> very serious, but depends on how you how you play the game. Um, yeah, how how you um, ski. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's more actually dangerous than in Taiwan and Hong Kong. Yeah, and we also talk about a little bit this afternoon about uh, the um, people was following your emails and the. Your I uh, your your phone yeah this kind of thing so yeah but uh, I'm not afraid mm, yeah just just um, yeah focus on <laughs> making the art. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, uh, sorry. I, I hope it, the the question didn't uh, lean too heavily one way because I think each of the things that you brought up were were really meaningful in that. Like uh, you know that whether it ranges from more personal um, gestures and interactions that then actually create a resource that can be sold and create a different kind of economic sustainability, or whether it's these gestures that are in some ways almost meant to be so absurd absurdist that people have to then reconsider that all of those things contribute to these conversations as well. Um, I guess uh, in terms of. It's funny I asked the question, but I'm not even quite sure how to answer it for myself because, um, <laughs> but I think a lot of, maybe there's two different levels to it, that being at Recology itself in some ways is, um, like I keep trying to figure out how to explain it to people. In some ways I feel like, and correct me if, I, if I'm misstating this, but I feel like part of the intention of having artists there is to, and they have tours coming through, so we're constantly talking to school groups and people coming through, that part of it is, opening up people's idea of what, what is thrown away and how to reimagine it and not just treat it as this disposable thing that you can have a different kind of relationship to it or um, perception on it that it can have these other lives um, and other value. And then um, I think in terms of the specific topic for the pieces, um, a lot of that, my relationship to how it fits into broader um, conversations around activism or community building is outside of the art making itself. Like the art making in some ways is almost the gesture and the way of thinking through these things and the, the work in, in those kinds of other political or activist fields is in the conversations that I have with folks um, you know, at CCC or in Chinatown or in some of the other neighborhoods where I do some work and that um, knowing that, that because that work takes so much time and so many other people mobilizing around these issues that this is just kind of like a gesture that allows me to contribute a little bit of imagination to to some of those things, and it's a way of think for me to think through those things. And um, but the actual work takes place outside of the studio or me making those those objects. Yeah. Does does anyone have any questions that you want to ask of the artists here? Any specific ones or ones to the, the panel more generally? Uh, contacting Nicolas Che was, we tried it, it's quite a difficult task, but we had the same problem when we collected 300,000 cigarette butts from the streets of Mexico City. And the first idea we had was to pack them up really beautifully and send them back to the cigarette uh, producers. But it's not only a question of producers, I think that we're all involved and, and that's one of the main problems. Um, yes, design sucks and design should be addressed in a very different way in, in terms of uh, production, industrial production. But, but also I think for us the debate was also about how do we act as consumers and how do we act as disposers. And I think we have to take that into account as well. So for us, it became very problematic to send it back only to the producer. Um, of course, we would love uh, 
Tse to realize what happened to his face that is now part of a garbage system. But we always think of that. How ridiculous can it be to put your brand on products that will become garbage and will be thrown all over the place just proving how dirty you are? <laughs> so, I don't know. What can I say? It's inverse publicity. <laughs> And I think that for me is that we are living in a disposable everything. We just dispose everything. A lot of things are just changing. And and for me, the change is not about... Uh, I mean, it's about different things, but it's more like a change of way of seeing the things uh, in, in in the way that we relate with the, with the things that we buy, that, with the things that we make, and... And that had a different uh, levels of connection with the other ones, and it's just full of a different context. It's not only about the materiality of things that we just throw away. It's about the connection that we have as a humans, and, and the way that that all of that is just changing us, and and let us uh, into a, a difficult uh, uh, direction. So. It's like trying to re-establish uh, different connection uh, with things and with humans, and you know. So I don't know if I'm explaining myself well, but yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, I'll, <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll start. Um, I, it, I think, I mean, I, I'm not going to claim that I'm always as good as I should be. But I think, you know, one of the things that all the artists who've gone through recology talk about is that you, when, you're, when you spend that much time around that much disposed dispose materials and see the, like, just the crap that we cycle through, and it, there's a way that it just, even on a psychological level, is going to stick with you. And now I can't go into a store and just buy stuff without at least considering, like, how, how am I actually going to use this? Do I need this? Is what's going to happen to this after I'm done going through this? Um, and so it's just, you know, it's like a, a cautionary thing of trying to, trying to be more considerate about my my consumption. Um, and I think in terms of my artistic practice, it's definitely shaped it because now prior to being there, all the materials I was using were like new art papers and, you know, spray painting them to color them and things like that. And now I almost exclusively use like more common either recycled materials or like everyday papers and things. And just because I, it, it's become so embedded in the way that I work and think through things. So, um, you know, there's, those are small, but they're, they're, uh, it's been impactful. I consume more because I need garbage. <laughs> if not, I run out of material to investigate. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> no, I mean, it has to shape the way you, you live. It's, it's impossible that it doesn't, but... Uh, one thing is how you live it, and the other thing is how you live it on everybody else, which is also quite impressive. So with the others, it's about one thing at a time, and with oneself, it's about not only what will happen to the things after, but where they came from and who made them, and what entanglements are behind that, I don't know. But it would be crazy. It, it, there's a very good exercise we do every once in a while that everybody should do at least once a year, which is carry everything you produce of, of waste for one day, 24 hours. And it, I thought I was a very clean and conscious person until I did that exercise, and then you realize that it's not true at all. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a good question for me <laughs> actually uh, yeah we have mask <laughs> I create the um, yeah the big mask uh, mask and uh, uh, which is some uh, sometimes people um, come to my studio and ask me to to borrow it <laughs> and wear it <laughs> and they yeah they they curious what what it looks like and yeah I, I think um, it's kind of new lifestyle maybe <laughs> you can come to try <laughs> and for me it's a very difficult question because I never lie, so uh, I, I didn't care about that <laughs> at the beginning. So, for example, I'm going to put a good example. We recollect more than 350,000 silver pots in the streets of downtown Mexico City. So, I didn't care about silver pots. I was totally obsessed with the, to try to find the society into the objects that I, I used to smoke during that time, so I was just surrounded by 350,000 cigarette pots and I was just smoking and putting more there, like, here we go, we want more, so we have more to mark and more to analyze, but at the end, I'm, I'm, I'm that typical person that, I mean, I, I never threw away trash in the streets, because I know that it's really bad. But it used to be, now I, I need to say, uh, that kind of person that I didn't care what was I buying. So this uh, proximity with the trash and with the things that, that we just start to do, start to provoke a change slowly in myself. So. When I finish, when we finish that that um, piece, I just quit smoking because of health reasons, and I didn't want to to quit smoking because then then the doctor just say, okay, you need to quit, and then that gave me the possibility to start thinking in in, in a new possibility. So that uh, just start a little change in me. So now I think that we check everything that that we buy and we try to trace every material and where it's coming and how it's produced and by who and where and so it just like became an, an obsession to know Don't go to the supermarket. <laughs> what, what, what is happening, yeah, 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 it just takes too long to go to the supermarket world but I also think that that happened to me in the specific things because I know that I now am more careful with what I buy and what also happened to me is that every time that I just go into store I always think, oh my god, this is so full of trash and why people is just buying all this shit, it's just so terrible that... but then I saw myself with part of that in a certain point during my life and I was like, oh my god, I have one. And what, I, and what I need to do with this? And Elana just keep everything. So we just became like a hoarders and we have uh, bottles with a pee in our studio and we have different kind of trashes there that we love. And what I mean is that with time, for me, it's like slowly giving me new perspective and a new relation with, with things. So I try to don't buy things that I don't need it because, I mean, who needs uh, 10 jackets and 20 pants and, you know, we, we are on that dynamic and for me, more recently, I'm, I'm thinking more about capitalism and the way that we are trained to buy all the time things that we don't need. So, and, and for me, that is just start to change in, in something. And now I just only buy things that I really love. <laughs> 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 and, and, it, and it is not all, uh, all the time, but well. There is no dance culture, we are a dance company. 
So when we do the performance in the theater, we very, very west. We threw away many, many things. Every performance ended. So in my end stage design, so I may I find the so he tried to um, make his props and set with recyclable materials. So the props that you see in the film are mostly uh, made from recycled materials. So we after each performance, all the props and all the sets, they usually have to go to be thrown away. So that's actually the volume is very big and very scary. It's It's really scary. So usually it's almost a, a whole truckload of waste. So to him, the way is to try to look for recyclable materials as much as possible. And then that's me. So uh, me too. So when I make my work, I try to use materials that are not new. So the bottles that you see has, uh, are basically leftovers from drinks that we had. And I also, like for this exhibition, I try to avoid bringing in stuff because I'm thinking about the, the, like the, the, the eco footprint. But then I'm here. So actually when I, when Iris invited me, I was thinking whether I should fly because yeah, it is a, in a way quite contradictory. So we are working on a show about sustainability and I'm flying long haul, but then I'm here. So I think it's always a matter of extent and trying to do as much as we can, like and um, I also run a non-profit. So when we do events, we try, so so I always have in mind the experience I had when I cleaned the bottles together with Owen, and you can not imagine how disgusting that is. So I will always remind me of that, and with that really tactile experience, that propels action. So with the non-profit that I run, whenever we do events, we try to avoid using um, disposable um, like. Eat um, cutlery or cups as much as we can, and if we really have to do that, we make sure that they are recyclable. Yeah, and also yeah, so so you just do as much you can as you can do. Okay, okay. 就是在我的书里面，然后你们会看到有一些人他们是去挖土的人，然后嗯、呃，我很嗯、呃、受。吸引，我觉得是吸引的是，这嗯，我受吸引的是，呃，我要去挖土的时候，去那些那些填土区或是那些工业地带，人如何受大环境影响，然后改变他们的生活方式。And so when she worked on the book and about the people digging clay, so she's really fascinated. Um, by how people, um, yeah, how people are influenced by the environment, and then how they shape their way of life. Uh, but when we interact with these laborers, we find that we care. We are focused on those people. Yeah, but the reality is that the people uh, who are the targets, the working class, are actually the people who. Who waste the most? 对，所以在我自己身上，我其实，嗯，有些朋友来到我家会说，哎，卫生纸在哪里？什么东西在在哪里？但我们生活方式就是用最基本，其实你，嗯，需要卫生纸的时候，你直接去用抹布，然后用可以再再回收的方式，那是我日常生活可以做到的事情。Yeah, so when her friends uh, go to her house, they'll ask her, oh, where's the tissue paper? And then she'll ask them to try using a, can a handkerchief because it's like um, the thing that, the little thing that we can do um, at an everyday level. And I think the most interesting thing is that now many companies are using the 
呃有机的东西，但是他们是更多的生产在生产这些环保的东西。And so, uh, to her, to her is somehow intriguing that a lot of companies, um, are saying that they're making organic or eco-friendly products, but the way that they produce all these products is actually not eco-friendly at all. So, I think, just to respond to the question, how can we use that is the most important thing. How can we use a bottle of water? How can we use it for how many times? So, to her, what is the most important is how we use all these products, like what Chief um, Chief Wu suggested, uh, like with a plastic bottle, we can use it for many times. <laughs> Unless there's any last questions that that's our time, any burning questions that people want to throw out, and I think people will still be here for and you'll have a chance to look at the work and engage with folks. So thank you again so much for being here and, and joining us. And thank you for, for your wonderful work and thoughts and insights into the work. <laughs>